Hey everyone, welcome to Resilience Unraveled. This podcast is a result of my fascination with subjects like resilience, accountability, burnout, life fulfillment, and other life and work based performance issues, as well as many of the other obsessions I bump into in my life. I spend my time working with highly successful teams, people, and organizations, and this podcast introduces their remarkable stories and expertise as well as my own synthesis of the key issues, strategies, tips, tools, and resources to thrive in life. If you find this podcast useful, why not go over to our site, qedod.com. If you'd like some resources on how to manage and beat burnout, head to qedod.com forward slash burnout 2019 for some goodies. Stay tuned to the end to find out details of how to order a free ebook. Enjoy the podcast. So something a little different today, and welcome to the podcast. Um, It's that time of the year again where we're sort of inundated by people telling us how to set New Year's resolutions, how to set goals, and all that sort of old nonsense. And um, I thought it'd be interesting just to sort of give a bit of a contrary view this year. And I was very taken by the idea that, um, with it being the year 2020, it was definitely scope for a cheap pun. And I'd like to ask you what you think... Megadeth, the fun-loving criminals, and George Benson might have in common. And here's a clue. I know it's a terrible pun, isn't it? But you know it's it's true actually. Um, I got I got to thinking that it's the year twenty twenty, and um, do you know what? It's it's the year of hindsight in a way. Twenty twenty. I mean, it's also twenty past eight. But that aside, I thought I'd talk a little bit about hindsight and maybe a little bit about foresight, and it sort of links into some of the other themes that we've um, been discussing across the course of this year. This has been a fascinating year for us. We've um, nearly hit our 100th podcast and, in fact, may have done that already. And I thought it was a good time to spend some time looking backwards as well. And hindsight's a very interesting phrase, isn't it? I mean, people talk about 2020 vision being perfect because it's hindsight. And it comes from, um, according to um, various sort of um, Google references, to something called the Snellen chart, which is actually um, a chart that's used to measure someone's visual acuity. So it is literally to do with vision. So someone who has 20-20 vision has normal acuity. And it says here, meaning that through a standard distance of 20 feet from an eye chart, they'll be able to see clearly each row of letters. So, you know, what's interesting is it's used a lot as this idea that we look backwards and we say, well, if we'd known that, we would have had 20-20 vision. And that's why hindsight is pure 20-20 vision. But that's interesting. You know, when we're looking back, actually we're seeing not just the event, but the results that took place. And sometimes we get results from the right things, which aren't necessarily what we want. And also when we look back, often what we do is we don't look back and are truly objective about what happened. We allow sort of emotional and emotional context and emotional reasoning to take over. Um, you know, if something's not worked out the way we should have done it, actually we, and if we're not being accountable um, well, what ends up happening is we can end up blaming other people for the things that have happened to us. So we can we sort of ignore our own part in terms of what's happened this uh, during the course of the year. And we also fall into that trap with confirmation bias of sort of getting to that stage of thinking, well, you know, um, it's been a successful year. And what you do is you look back and you notice all the things that actually um, were part of your success. And you don't necessarily draw the learning from the year that's gone. So I think one of, the, one of the things to do is, when we're looking back, is two things to bear in mind. Bear in mind that when you're looking back, you're looking for emergent themes. So you're not looking for things that are good or, or for bad. What you're looking for things which are appearing to you. So you can actually cut that confirmation bias out. And then be objective, um, both about the context in which you found yourself, as well as the results. Because sometimes those results aren't, aren't happen, don't happen because of what you've done. It's happened because of what someone else has done. And so being truly accountable about your successes and failures is really important because the point of accountability, the point of this process is to actually build some learning into next year and to figure out what you're going to reinforce and what you're um, 
going to um, avoid next time because this idea of foresight is quite interesting you know using sort of normal planning goal setting but particularly risk pl- risk management techniques um, helps you avoid all the bumps in the road I mean I remember sitting down with an organization once and, and looking just one year ahead and there was pretty well nothing that couldn't be forecast for that year and actually when we reviewed the plan every single thing that we suspected would have happened came out within the tolerances of you know two or three scenarios it's a steady state uh, boomer bust or um, something a little bit more radical and everything is you know whether everything is understandable you can look at trends they can help you look at the road ahead for example we know there's a big move to think about things like burnout there's big you know big environmental thrust there's a big technological technological thrust around ai if i could say that would be easier and um and we understand the concepts of seasonality so there shouldn't really be anything in the in the future that actually gets in the way for us getting sort of sorted now one of the things to look back actually during the course of the era also is to is to look for the signals which if you don't take them together can be um signs of burnout and I've become particularly interested my, myself this year in this idea of burnout, not just because it was redesignated earlier this year, but actually because um, it's become a very useful thing in the workplace to be able to, to think about how we're doing. And I think one of the classic things that happens in the workplace is because it's a workplace condition, organisations pay a lot of money for employees to get themselves sorted out without necessarily looking at their own processes and routines and rituals and cultures. And I've spoken on other people's podcasts about this over the course of the year. And I'd like you to just have a think about some of these following signs. So an increase in headaches, uh, tiredness, but I don't just mean being slightly tired. I mean that sort of tired all the time or almost physically exhausted type of tiredness. Um, The idea of withdrawing a bit from the social setting at work, but also social settings at home, being too exhausted to go out and enjoy yourself. Um, Actually taking less enjoyment in or pleasure at the work you're doing and almost um, getting to that stage of becoming um, sort of indispensable. You see yourself as being indispensable. Nobody else can do this. Nobody else can do this as well as me. And the last sign to look for is working at weekends and communicating either inbound or outbound with people when they're on holiday. And I think if you're doing some of those things, you're heading towards burnout. And there's two things you need to think about for the following year. One is what you're doing about yourself. Because actually burnout, in my view, comes from two chemical imbalances. One which is the cortisol um, approach, which is linked to stress. And the other is dopamine, which is literally the addiction to work scenario, which I see increasingly these days. And it's a heady cocktail when those two things come together, where you're stressed and excited at the same time, when you're loving what you're doing, you're becoming indispensable, but then the stress is sort of starting to affect your affect your sleep. It's starting to affect your ability to um, take decent exercise, um, and also this idea of um, you know just actually focusing and having some sort of life other than just work. I think. It's this idea that we, if we're going to work hard, we should definitely play hard as well. And um, I think as you get across this sort of Christmas period, one of the things to look back is, one of the things to do is to look back and pull out these learning points. And um, Christmas is an interesting time because um, I was chatting to someone I know who was in America and they just were telling me how much they'd um, not enjoyed Thanksgiving, uh, having to sit around with family and grit their teeth and get through it, I think was the expression. And I think some of the things we have to do is we have to sort of see Christmas as a time perhaps where we we do reconnect with family, where we do actually maybe reset our minds and see the social side of things or the family side of things. It's not a chore to be endured, but actually something that, you know, could be could have pleasure taken in it. And frankly, if you're not taking pleasure in it, perhaps you should change your routine. I mean, I've talked to one person this year who they're not just they're just not having a family Christmas. They're going to go away. Something I do every year. We we always go away at Christmas just because actually we don't have a family particularly that's um, involved with us, and so we want to go away and have some fun. And why shouldn't you live your own life? Because actually, it's time you started doing that. And if and if you are genuinely finding family duties, families to be a duty, then you you, you need to think about that sort of thing. Um. But if you are going to be um, with your family, you are going to be with your spouse, your partners, your kids, whatever that might be, I think one of the key things to do is to reconnect by being present there all the time. 
Um, there's a few people I've read this year who talk about the fact that when people are at home, they spend a lot of their time distracted on iPads, in front of Netflix or Amazon or you know, the myriad of um, streaming services. But also, you know, they're not present because actually they're, they're just... They're just flicking and they're popping and uh, engaging with social media. And I really suggest that you have a think about reconnecting both with sort of steam life, which is outside of social media, maybe have a social media holiday, and maybe just spend some time doing the sort of traditional things that perhaps we used to do as kids. I mean, radical idea, why not get a board game out? And um, I remember I and my kids talk about the fact that actually the fights we used to have when we played board games at Christmas. And there was sort of, you know, it's a sense of nostalgia that comes from a, a kinesthetic exercise that involves people. It's visceral, it's touching, it's it's moving things around rather than just playing on computers. Not that there's anything the matter with computers, but actually doing visceral exercises, board games, going out, walking, talking, playing, running, skipping, dancing, all those sorts of things. That's the chance to, to reconnect and be present and critically be present with your partner. And the point of Christmas, which always seems to be to be a, a massive commercial, um, well, just a, 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 it's a hijacking, really, of the sentiment of what the holidays were really about. But why not use it as a chance to, you know, go offline? Why, nobody really expects you to be around at work. And if you are being around, you've got to ask yourself, you know, why are you wearing that super superhero cape and leaping around the place when really no one's that interested? Um I know most people are sort of parked down and nobody really sort of has a problem of someone's disappearing. I mean, if you work at Christmas, obviously that's slightly different. But for those people who aren't, it's good to get a chance to do that. And if you can't do that in December, then do it in January sometime. Remember that burnout's an insidious thing and it creeps on you when you least um, expect it. And that's why it's really important. Now, um, I think one of the things that um, has, uh, I have been always interested in is this idea of setting sort of good resolutions and things in January, and then by about January the 3rd, we've already blown them. Not because we set too many, they're not things we're really interested in, and actually they're just the same old, same old things. But I was listening to a guy called Peter, uh, Dr. Peter Atiyah, a podcast I listen to and really love. Uh, it's long, but it's fascinating. And he's been doing some work around um, d- dementia prevention, longevity, healthy longevity, um, Alzheimer's and such like. And apparently all the research just shows the same thing, that there is nothing better for these three areas, longevity, health, uh, Alzheimer's prevention, than nutrition, exercise and sleep. And so one of the things I think is that we've got to think about taking one of those areas and one of those things and turn, do it, turning it into something you're going to do. That's going to be um, something that you continue over the course of time. And so there's a couple of things to, to really think about there. Um, it's that thing about, you know, if you're going to do something, do one thing and, and set some sort of social accountability. Say I'm going to, um, you know, cut out bread and, you know, I'm going to have a cut out bread challenge. And I'm going to cut it out for one month, for example, and I'm telling everybody and when I get to the end of the month, I'm going to commit. That's why things like Movember and um, you know other sorts of monthly things seem to work quite well because because there is a social context and so that social accountability I think is really important for people to to um, think about. So to commit to less something that you're interested, something that maybe is a trigger to stop you doing other things, but you know make make that work. And and one of the things I think is interesting about. Um, Next year, um, if you're going to look at nutrition, exercise or sleep, one of those things, um, one, one element of one of those things is great. That's good. Uh, another thing for, to think about is maybe we've got to get over this idea of characterizing people as snowflakes. Um, I think it's, it's time for us to be um, to help people become and learn to become more accountable so they understand how to fail, how to learn, how to put things right and how to how to be in control, how to cope, in other words. I was very taken by a podcast I ran this year with someone who talked about this idea of people who, have, who are parents and to have low control. In other words, their parents have done everything for them. And then parents are surprised when they, those kids get to you know, early teen, teens, teenager um, or have first relationships and they can't cope. Well, it's because they're being parented that way. And if we have generally got, a, or genuinely got um, a generation of snowflakes, then our generation need to look at ourselves rather than them first. 
And um, and I think it's you know it's incumbent on us to start teaching people those sorts of skills and maybe looking looking earlier into times to thinking about how to parent better. And uh, last thing to think about is I'd like you to think of one thing that you should do which you've always discounted because it's rubbish, even though you've never done it. I was very minded uh, quite recently on a training course when um, I was talking to some pe some people about anxiety and a very simple concept of this idea of worry time where you 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 define a specific time of the year a uh, day where you decide that you will focus your attention to worry at a particular time and one person said that's just a terrible idea that will never work for me and after the question have you ever done it to which the answer was no then you know my point is well how do you know if you've never done it you know do it five or six times if it doesn't work then come back to me with that evidence and say it didn't work but don't just discount things because they haven't worked because I think what we're guilty of doing in the learning is the, the, the learning arena, if we're not careful, and especially if we're going to think about more learning, is this idea that we have to we have to be more scientific in the way we experiment with our learning. Do more of it, experiment with it, and then make judgments. Don't just do it once and give up. So um, this is the end of uh, 2019. It's been a fantastic year for for us. I've had a great year, and I'm looking forward to um, 2020. And I'm hoping at the end of 2020 to think of another terrible pun to welcome you into 2021. But before that, please accept all my best wishes for the season, for you and your family. Thanks for listening with us through the course of this year. And as I always say, take care. Thanks for listening today. You can go to our site qedod.com forward slash podcasts and subscribe to hear other titles in our series. Or you can contact us at info at qedod.com to hear and find out more about tough love, leadership, accountability, resilience and burnout. You can go to our site qedod.com forward slash burnout 2019 to hear and get access to a load of resources to help you manage and fight burnout. And you can go to qedod.com forward slash free ebook to hear more about the fundamentals of resilience. Until the next episode, keep on thriving!